Good evening, folks. Thank you very much for joining us. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll just give it a few seconds while everyone's coming on in. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Hello, hello, welcome. Okay. Well, I think we've got most people in. Yeah, so we'll make a start. Well, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the online Nature Trek Roadshow. I'm Sarah Frost, I'm Nature Trek's marketing manager, and I'll be your host for this evening. Now, tonight's roadshow focuses on the Baltics. And of course, we planned this evening several months ago, and the timing is now far from ideal as all of us in the Nature Trek office have been extremely upset by the scenes that we're seeing daily on the news of what's unfolding in Ukraine. We did consider canceling this evening, but we want to show solidarity with our guides and partners in Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania who are once again really going to struggle for income for another year. We want to support them and sow the seeds for future travel for when things have calmed down. So these presentations are very much for wetting people's appetites and talking about the great wildlife of each destination, but we're not anticipating running tours to these areas for the foreseeable future. The situation is very difficult and unfortunate with Belarus, which was due to feature in tonight's schedule as well, but we felt we had no option but to drop the talk from tonight's program and we won't be sending business there anytime soon. But on to brighter and better things, the Baltics are a superb area for birding, and that's what we're talking about this evening. They're superb for birding in all seasons, and they're host to an impressive migration in spring and autumn. In spring, geese, waders, passerines migrate through the region, and in autumn, the southbound migration follows mostly the same routes, with many birds resting and feeding along the coasts. And it's a land of great beauty with magnificent coastlines and substantial areas of forest, wetlands and rich meadows. And to take us to these wonderful countries, I'm joined by two of our knowledgeable tour leaders, David Morris and Kevin Ellsby, operations manager, Alison Steele. And it's a great pleasure to have Marius and later on Rubili joining us from Lithuania live, who will be able to contribute to Alison's talk as well. So a very warm welcome to all of you. Now, as always, folks, please do ask as many questions as you like using the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We'll answer all of these at the end of the evening. So I hope you're sitting comfortably with a glass of wine and some nibbles. And now taking us to Estonia is David. Over to you, David. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm uh, yeah, David Morris. Uh, I've been working with Nature Trek as a, a tour leader for uh, about 15 years, I think, this year, somewhere of that order. Um, and my day-to-day -day job, I work for the RSPV as our uh, operations manager for um, uh, Cumbria and Northeast England. Um, yeah, tonight's tour is mostly going to feature around the Estonia in Spring tour, which I've been doing for about eight years now. Uh, working alongside my Estonian counterpart, Matty Coes. Um, I think Estonia is an absolutely fantastic country and probably shares a lot of uh, commonality with many of the other Baltic states that we'll be uh, hearing about tonight. But for me, the first time I went there was utterly blown away by the kind of wildlife, the people, the landscape, the culture, the habitats. And it really, if I want to sum Estonia up, is it, it's kind of like Eastern Europe meets Northern Europe in terms of the sort of birdig avifauna and some of the habitats that are present there. Bit of geography for those that are not too familiar where Estonia is. It's the most northerly of the Baltic states. Uh, right up at the top end of the Baltic against the uh, the Finnish Gulf, just south of Finland, um, north of Latvia, and uh, just slightly to the west of Russia. Um, it's probably one of um, Europe's most underpopulated countries, um, and probably certainly one of the most kind of underdeveloped in terms of the habitat, but that doesn't by any means mean the country isn't uh, underdeveloped. It's a, it's a very modern um pleasant uh, country, uh, fantastic people, fantastic cuisine, standard of living. It's a, it's a really great place to go and enjoy a holiday looking at nature. Um, 
the trip that we do is a three stop trip. Uh, we fly into Tallinn in the north, the capital city, um, and then uh, using minibuses to get around that Matty and I drive, we uh, move over into Western Estonia first in two parts. Uh, we spend the first part of our trip uh, up in the uh, northwest of the country, uh, up, up above Matsalu Nature Reserve, um, staying just outside a, a little village um, there, Ruslepa. Um, and then we move further south down past Panu into staying at a, a nice place just outside of uh, village Khadam East uh, on the coast there, before then moving east uh, towards Most, where we stay uh, over towards the Russian border to explore the sort of different uh, landscape and species in the east of the country. So flying to Tallinn, as I say, rather delightful modern city, very colourful, um, pick up our, our minibuses, meet the group, and then off we go into the Estonian countryside. At that time of spring, it's a really great place because you've got this kind of changeover, I think it's sort of set out there, where you've got this mix of wintering birds and some of the spring migrants and some of the summer breeders all colliding at that same time in around mid-May. I think one of the first things that really overwhelms you as you're driving west through the Estonian countryside on, on route to our first hotel is just the quantity of things like geese, particularly kind of barnacle geese, bean geese in particular, out feeding across the Estonian countryside. We arrive at our first stop, which is a, a, a really nice selection of kind of uh, wooden uh, log cabins in amongst the kind of native pine forests there. Uh, familiarise ourselves, familiarise ourselves with uh, some of the kind of wildlife there, which are not too dissimilar to anyone in Britain, but uh, often encounter things like red squirrels, uh, crested tits, uh, some waxwings moving about and sometimes sort of displaying in there amongst the pine woods. And then for those that want to just stretch through the dunes uh, behind the pine woods onto uh, some really nice beaches along the kind of Baltic Sea coast there, uh, where at that time of year kind of migrants like kind of wind chats, stone chats, uh, swallows, martins, things like that are starting to move their way through the country on the way up into the Baltic. So get to bed having enjoyed a nice meal, um, ready for a, a reasonably early start to go out into the woodlands um, at, at dawn to try and find some of the specialities of that part of Western Estonia. Uh, the woodlands there are really fantastically diverse, all well-managed, uh, productive woodland, as well as some kind of really nice ancient, uh, kind of fairly more extensively managed woodland. And really some of the woodpeckers are some of the kind of star treats of the show that many people go on the trip to see. So generally have a, a, a good week um, seeing plenty of these. So things like top left, we've got a Syrian woodpecker, middle spots, we get great spots, lesser spotted. There's a missile like black woodpecker skirting through the image there, as well as kind of woodpecker relatives like Rhineck, which are just found all around uh, where we stay. After a morning's treat of uh, woodpeckers and a nice warming breakfast out in the field, it's off for some sea watching. And this is the Pusapesa Peninsula. This sticks out into the Baltic um, and gives you a kind of nearly 360 degree panoramic view of migration at that time of year. It's one of the best sea watching experiences I've ever had in my life. Um, absolutely fantastic at that time of year with a kind of range of kind of ducks, geese, orcs, divers, uh, birds of prey all starting to move through. So some of the species there, big numbers of um, geese, beans and uh, barnacles particularly pushing through. Buicks and hooper swans, some still knocking about kind of in wintering populations, good populations of things like black-throated diver, um, lots of sea duck, huge numbers if, if the conditions are right of things like long-tailed duck and eiders, often flying over your head, giving amazing views. Um, and kind of velvet scoter to their bottom left. And then birds of prey kicking about as well. So things like horny buzzards, Montague's harriers, hobbies, all those sort of things starting to stream through as the spring starts opening. And yeah, get some incredible views. All the photos incidentally in this slideshow are, are, are taken on that trip. Um, so any photographers in the group get amazing photographic opportunities with very little effort or need to be in a hide. We then move out from sea watching to sort of explore the middle of the day into the landscape. That time of year, cranes are returning back to their breeding grounds. So you've got birds bugling away in the edges of forests and bogs, 
here with a bit of a light snowfall at that time of the year. And then some of the mammals of the country. So Estonia also has a really good uh, uh, mammal flora and particularly uh, some of those kind of large predatory mammals. So things like kind of wolf, brown bear, European lynx, some of the highest densities of any other European country. Um, things like elk there on the left, um, commonly encountered on the trip. And then uh, on the right there, we've got a uh, wolf footprint. Um, don't usually see wolf, but very often encounter uh, recent tracks and signs like footprints and droppings. And it's it's just a case of being in the right place at the right time. And hopefully, if you're on a trip, we bump into them. Then move down in towards the sort of local town to check out the local uh, municipal ponds and park. Um, and at that time of year, you've got Slavonian grebes starting to display and nest build on uh, many of the town parks in that area, giving amazing views. And, and often the group there looking at these birds as kind of the locals are coming around fascinated what we're looking at. But the beauty of these birds is remarkable and, and just totally not bothered by uh, people walking past or looking at them, totally habituated to people. We then moved down to explore some of the bigger wetlands within that area and particularly down into Matsalu Bay. Um, this is a huge nature reserve and kind of complex of really extensively managed wetlands, uh, Baltic meadows and uh, one of the largest reed beds in Europe within Matsu, Matsalu Bay. Uh, this is a fantastic viewpoint from um, the uh, viewing tower at Heska, somewhere where we stay. Um, and visit, have lunch or an evening meal barbecue there um, to enjoy a really good afternoon's birding. Quick plodge into some of those reed beds around there and we've got things like redneck grebes courting and nest building, uh, blue throats clicking from uh, the reeds as we go through the, the boardwalks that intersect into these wetlands as spring's really starting to unfold. Now this is Heska, um, this is a lovely traditional Estonian thatched property um, which does um, guest accommodation and also provides us with some really nice meals out in the field. Um, and the tower hide there that you can see in the background sets the record for the most species seen in 24 hours at any point in Europe. So really fantastic panoramic viewpoint where you've got vast quantities of uh, wildfowl waders and a range of other species that can easily be seen from that place. That time of year, um, Big flocks of rough starting to come back through. They're kind of colourful males, busy displaying about. Um, really good place to see Mahaska. Um, also birds starting to set up territory in some of those wet Baltic meadows. Geese are plenty. Uh, these are greater white fronts, often with the lesser number of lesser uh, white fronts in there. Bean geese, as I say, bar mostly barnacles at that time of year, and often with the odd red-breasted goose thrown in for good measure. And usually what's keeping them up in the air is uh, good quantities of uh, white-tailed eagles that are doing really well in the country and particularly feeding on some of the kind of wildfowl and stuff around that Baltic coast and give brilliant views. I mean, incredible numbers. Some days up at that viewing tower at Heska, you, you're sat there and you can see kind of 10, 10 white, white tails at any one point, just keeping the kind of cranes and the wildfowl and the waders up in the air. Back to the hotel to enjoy uh, one of many fantastic sunsets over the Baltic coast before going back out to, uh, to look for some of the kind of more crepuscular uh, goodies in the woods behind where we stay. A uh, good range of owls that we encounter, uh, greatly assisted by Matty, who leads the tour with me, who's a local Estonian and a bird a conservationist out in Estonia. Um, and he, earlier on in the spring, is doing various bird surveys in the woods around there and really helping to pin down territories of these birds, including species like uh, pygmy owl here, this, this, by the way, was a, an absolute chance encounter we had with a bird that uh, came out really early on in the uh, evening in full light and again was totally not phased by us next to the road where we were we, we were watching in a forestry track. And then again came back the following morning and that bird was still there about. Our second uh, stop for the trip, as I say, we're moving further south down the Baltic coast towards the Latvian border um, and staying just outside uh, Matty's uh, home village, actually, of Hadamist. Um, this is um, 
a ex uh, Soviet uh, astronaut sort of holiday resort that we stay on on the coast there, um, just above um, the famous Cavley Birds Observatory. Uh, that's uh, the kind of main dining area and lounge area at the thing. And again, um, each of us has um, a nice little sort of lodge tucked into the pines with views over uh, a number of kind of lagoons and scrapes and the Baltic Sea coast in front. So absolutely fantastic birding from your bed, if you want, but great birding from breakfast and uh, at all times from the, the accommodation there. And that's the sort of habitat that surrounds us. This is... Uh, Pickler pools, this is a, a range of uh, Baltic meadows where we get things like Baltic dunlin displaying and breeding there in the spring. Some really nice reed bed complexes. And uh, there's also a, a group of um, X uh, kind of fish farm um, that's been modified into a reed bed complex now that's managed specifically for nature conservation, giving a really exciting dynamic reed bed system full of kind of bitterns, crakes, rails, and a range of other exciting species just behind the Baltic coast seawall. Other gems of those meadows at that time of year in the Kanapanu district, so uh, citrine wagtails, um, plenty of citrine wagtails to fill your boots with, and again uh, we visit a site where these just, they're kind of feeding around your feet and around the path and so some incredible views of this really stunning wagtail species. Uh, species like penduline tits, uh, knocking about a plenty, often find their sort of pendulous nests uh, in amongst some of the willows. And it's not just about the birds, some really great butterflies as well, and a range of early odonata that we also find, uh, things like checkered skipper um, species, um, Good, good northern species on the bogs, things like cranberry fritillary, and um, some of those kind of harder to find sort of northern species like fiery coppers. And talking of the bogs, there are some absolutely pristine bog environments that we go and visit in Estonia. This is Nigula bog. Um, brilliant as a kind of bog conservationist myself to see what these intact bog systems look like. Um, and here the birding can be really good where we've got things like wood sandpiper, curly, wimbrel breeding out here, uh, golden eagle nesting in some of these pines. Yeah, really exciting range of species. And then some of the woodland grouse as those bogs transition into the kind of native pine woods. Um, the old adage of do bears poo in the woods is not true because uh, here out on the boardwalk, bears also poo on the bog. Um, so yeah, really interesting to see some of those large mammal signs as well. Keeps you on your toes and uh, gets you excited for what you might find around the corner. And uh, one of the much sought after species on the trip is Capacale, um, large woodland grouse um, that we visit um, a number of kind of uh, areas that are really good for cappers and lek sites. Um, and kind of observe those birds from a distance to avoid disturbance. But um, probably every other trip that I've done, we've encountered a rogue male. And this is my uh, our colleague, Matty, who leads the trip with me. Um, we had a, a rogue male that at one point wouldn't let the minibus down the road. Uh, we all got out from a, a, a sort of safe distance to kind of look at this uh, uh, majestic male. Um, all the group then hid behind me and Matty and it, as it came for us, but gave some incredible um, views for the for the group, including uh, this photo that I took uh, of that same male. Some really nice wood meadows, a habitat that's really underrepresented in the UK, but some really good examples here in Estonia. And these are kind of wooded areas that have been managed over the decades to produce hay so really floristic really good for butterflies but really fantastic for birds and this is one particular place that we'll visit that's thriving in kind of a range of species um average year um, we get some really nice weather kind of a good spring warm spring day in the uk kind of getting up to 18 degrees sometimes at that time of year short sleeves and the beauty is it's well before the mosquitoes and midges come out uh, but uh, yeah what a difference a year can make this was uh, another year at the same time when we had a snow flurry so yeah pack for all those eventualities but whatever happens we'll do a good nature trek picnic and usually includes uh, plenty of hot food and drink as well at that time of year on our picnics and yes you can get lucky that's that same picnic site um, where uh, one of us walked towards a tree, probably to go and find uh, the use of it behind it, and out, out popped Ural Owl. Um, again, it's a bird we often see in the evenings, but 
brilliant to encounter this species in the daytime. Uh, species like nutcracker are also common within the woods there. And as I say, a range of really interesting plants as well for the, the sort of more general naturalist species like twin flower, hepatica, we've got pulsatilla, uh, spring um, uh, snow and enemy and, and things like military orchid in a good year. We then move a bit further east for our final stop. Um, this is over towards the Russian border in a, a, a converted uh, vodka distillery. We're greeted when we arrive with shots of vodka um, and a really nice end with some really nice plush accommodation here um, in this fantastic building with some really tastefully uh, restored with a range of nice bedrooms and great food here, but location, location as well. So you can see the bottom right there. I mean, this fantastic uh, tarn, absolutely hooching with bird life straight outside of the room. Hawfinches feeding often on the lawn around there. Uh, the rose finches, as they start coming in, firing up, saying they're pleased to meet us. Uh, really brilliant place as a base for birding. One of the main reasons we skip over to Eastern uh, Estonia um, is to go and look at some of the, uh, the meadows over there. And we'll do at least one evening looking at a, a great snipe lake in one of the meadows out in that area. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I haven't got any photos of great snipe lekking. Um, certainly uh, my dust capabilities and my camera are not that good, but we do get some really good views where you can kind of observe them jumping about and hearing them calling. So yeah, certainly one of the best uh, great snipe lecking experiences I've had in Europe um, on this trip. Always bumping into black grouse everywhere. Although I must admit, this is the first time I've seen black grouse in a field full of onions. Um, and this is just testament to the kind of really extensively managed countryside out in Estonia, semi-natural habitats, bumping into really quite extensively managed uh, farmland where many of these species are really doing well. But also out in the east of Estonia is also some really good woodland and the start of the sort of boreal tiger forest as well, which is where we get some of the other woodland specialists that we don't see in the west so much. This is one of those sort of woodlands that we go in, some really fantastic trails to explore. As you can see, the wooden enemies, the spring flowers are coming through and the birds are starting to come out. We're obviously concerned in the UK about the decline of species like wood warbler top left. I mean, the woodlands in this area are absolutely hooching full of wood warblers and that sort of spinning coin display that we hear. We've also got stuff like greenish warbler top right and then some of the other uh, specialists that we go in there, things like red breasted flycatcher, you can see down on the bottom right. Um, and again, all, all the woodpeckers really well represented there. And again, if you're lucky, bump into a Ural owl, and this was a nest site we just happened to chance upon in a collapsed old birch top with the female sat there. Now, Ural owl do have a tendency to be a bit narky near the nest, so definitely one to keep a distance from, but really observe. And we've we've actually been back towards uh, that nest site, and that, that, that bird has returned for the last three years I've been doing this trip, and she sits there patiently, and we can observe from a distance away, even in the daytime, to get really good views of that bird. So overall, I definitely recommend Estonia as a top birding destination for anyone with a, a real desire to see a great mix of sort of spring passage and the end of winter birding um, with some great food and some great people in a really nice country. That's it for me. Thank you very much, David. That was a fantastic talk and really well illustrated there. I absolutely love the photographs of the uh, the Capicale. Just fantastic, very enviable. Kevin, over to you now, if uh, you're ready to take us to Latvia. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Right, you need to just unmute. Can't hear you yet, Kevin. And if you're able to turn your camera on as well. That's better. Can you hear me and see me now? There we go. We can Sorry hear and see that. you. And it looks like you're somewhere very cold. Right. Okie dokie. Your background. Yeah. Uh, what, about, what about the screen? Are you seeing the right screen? The sir? screen is fine. Yeah, Fantastic. we've got Latvia full screen looking good. Take Thank it away. You. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, good evening, everybody. Um, 
those of you who don't know me, I've been a, a, a leader for Nature Trek for about 20 years now. Um, my profession was in the medical profession, actually. I was a GP for 30 years, but I've been a naturalist all my life. Um, I apologize in advance, by the way, if I, if I do cough and splutter through this, because I'm one of the many in the throes of recovering from COVID at the moment. But uh, I think before I start, it's probably worth saying that there's going to be a, a degree of overlap here in my talk with what uh, David's already presented to us. And that's really a, a measure of the uh, similarities, if you like, in the wildlife across the three uh, Baltic states in terms of the wildlife and also the, the geography and the geology of, of the three. But nonetheless, I'm going to be talking uh, about Latvia and um, you'll see some similarities and hopefully some differences too. And certainly from my perspective, Latvia also is a great country to go and uh, discover the wildlife of uh, that part of Europe. So without further ado, here's a, a map to orientate you. Uh, hopefully this mouse will work. You can see we'll fly from, from London on a, on a flight direct to Latvia, to Riga, the capital of uh, Latvia. And Riga is actually, interestingly, I think it's got one of the best airports I've ever been to. Uh, it really is a super airport. So here's Riga in the center. And uh, this will be our first sort of area to one of our first areas to, to visit the Karami National Park. But really, we'll start at Cape Kolka uh, on the Gulf of Riga, just over here. And this island here, Sar Sararema, I was actually on there last week. This is part of Estonia. So you can see there's a very good close proximity between Estonia and uh, Latvia, with obviously Lithuania down at the bottom of the map. And as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of similarity and a lot of overlap. So we'll start our tour here at Cape Kolka. We'll have a couple of uh, nights there exploring the area and particularly the, the spit that points out into the Gulf of Riga. Then we'll move uh, eastwards, calling it Karemi National Park. And then we'll be based for our second uh, a few days at Lake Lubans in, in the sort of east central uh, Latvia. So this is, uh, I'd say, this is what our itinerary. We start off at Cape Kolka, go over to Kemeri National Park and then Lake Lubans and then return uh, back to London. Now, um, this is um, the capital Riga and it's a very historic city, uh, similar in many respects to Tallinn in terms of its interest from archeological architectural points of view and there will be opportunities either at the beginning of the tour or at the end of the tour to take an extension or a, a pre-tour uh, stay in uh, Riga to have your own sort of exploration and the company Nature Trek rather will be able to set that up uh, for you and help you out on that. So why do we go to Cape Kolka? Well the main reason is of its juxtaposition jutting into the Gulf of Riga. These big arrows, at the time we're, go we're going to be there in May, represent the sort of flight paths of birds that are coming up from uh, southern Europe and, and, and Africa and further east, up through into northern Europe and beyond for the breeding season. And also, obviously, there's a potential for birds to move from the east of Europe and concentrate in this area uh, of, of Latvia. So this will be our first stop on the Cape uh, Kolka, <coughs> excuse me. And this is the sort of typical view we'd get here and uninspiring fields you may think, but nonetheless, they are really worthwhile exploring because they really do concentrate a lot of the spring migrants in these bushes and in these, uh, in these trees. Now, obviously, uh, I'm sure you're aware that migration, the best time for migration is uh, dependent on weather conditions. So we need the weather to be right for uh, really good migration. On the other hand, it's good at any time, but if the conditions are absolutely right, these bushes can be more or less dripping with red starts and, and uh, other migratory birds that have come up from the south on their way further north or to, to breed in, in the Baltic region. And the traditional sort of um, church that you would go past in Cape Kolka, uh, just walking from our accommodation to the, the actual uh, beach itself and the, and the point where we will be able to look out 
just showing you a, a, a view of inside the, the place that we stay near Cape Colca. Simple, but very, uh, very comfortable, great food, uh, very, very friendly people. And, you know, we, we really do have a good time staying here. All sort of mod comms as well, as you might imagine. So anyway, what, let's get to some of the, the reason we're going to be going there, which is the birds, really. Um, so the migratory season in May in the Baltic regions, it can be absolutely superb. And some of the birds we will hope to see will include things like tree pipit, uh, which migrate in great numbers in, into this part of the world in the spring. We'll even have birds like brambling. Bramblings, obviously, to us in the UK, they don't breed in the UK. There are one or two that do breed in, um, in uh, Latvia, and we should certainly encounter them on, on many of our days as we're going around the country. Um, there are lots of redback shrikes also. Some of them are migratory, just passing through, but nonetheless, there is still also a breeding population of these lovely birds, and we should certainly get ample opportunities, not just to, to see them, but those who are keen photographers will uh, be more than pleased with the opportunities for photographing them. Other birds to find are more tricky, perhaps a little bit less showy than a red back shrike. So birds like pied flycatcher, for example, a bit more hidden in the bushes, but that's one of the joys of bird watching at a migratory hotspot. You never know what you might encounter. And we rely on each other in a group to be able to look for uh, birds and point things out to each other as we go along. That, that's always a good philosophy. Birds like the rose finch as well, as, as David pointed out, not only are they beautiful to look at, but they also have a wonderful song in the springtime. And there's normally a good population of rose finches knocking around uh, the Kolka area, as well as throughout the rest of the places we visit in uh, Latvia. Some of the more uh, obscure, if you like, birds we might encounter are things like Blythe's reed warbler. Now this, um, is a, a fairly um, subdued color, a colored bird, more often heard than seen, but we, they have such a very distinctive song that once you get your eye in, we should certainly be able to pick out a few of those because this will, these birds breed in Latvia and we certainly encounter them on a reasonably regular basis. So it's a great opportunity to, to get a, you know, a really good view of these birds, which are actually quite rare in Britain. Uh, as passage birds. And then more familiar birds, perhaps like the bearded tit here, very distinctive. Lots of those around the coast uh, of the Kolka area with the big reed beds that are, are, are associated with that part of, of Latvia. And other reed bed specialties, uh, things like the great reed warbler. This is a bird that's about as big as a song thrush. It's much bigger than a common reed warbler. I've got a very, very distinctive song. And there are many of these also spread around uh, the many reed beds and a, a suitable habitat within the country, but not just on the coast, but also uh, at Lake Lubans, where we end up in, our, in the second of our two-stay trip. And David mentioned the, the wildfowl, the waterfowl in this part of the world on the coast, and it, as far as Estonia is concerned, and Latvia is no less uh, well supplied with them. And this is a long-tailed duck in flight. This actually, I took this photograph last week when I was in Estonia, and there were thousands upon thousands of these birds on the coast uh, and the Gulf of, uh, of, of uh, the Baltic there, and this is typical of not just this time of the year, uh, or, but also, um, hello, but also in the spring in Latvia. And if we're really lucky, we may encounter these birds too. This is Stella's Ida. This is a, a very much declining seabird nowadays, found in the uh, Baltic. Uh, not only in Estonia, but also on the coast of Latvia. Everything depends on the particular circumstances, weather-wise, uh, appertaining at the time of our visit. But this is certainly one to keep our eyes out for. And also, uh, the, they're not just um, ducks on the, the Gulf, but they're also birds like uh, black-throated diver, uh, reasonably common. This is obviously a bird in summer plumage, so the ones we would encounter are probably not going to be as well adorned as that, but you never know. It depends on how far advanced their breeding cycle is. But also many, many thousands of common cranes. Cranes breed in good numbers in Latvia, but there are also 
substantial populations that pass through heading further north uh, into Scandinavia, then we will certainly encounter uh, these birds. Dramatic at any time, but especially at dusk when you hear them gathering together to roost and their, their bugling call. It's very, very evocative experience. And as David mentioned, birds of prey are always on, on the menu to, to look for. So if we've got top left, we've got honey buzzard, top right, hobby, bottom right, rough leg buzzard, and bottom left, pallid harrier. But, you know, there's a huge diversity, not just of uh, birds of prey, but many, many other species of birds to be uh, on the lookout for in this part of the world. And going back to the, the reed bed areas or wetland areas, as David mentioned, this spectacular wagtail, the citrine wagtail, breeds in reasonable numbers. They're nowhere very common, but they breed in reasonable numbers in Latvia, and uh, we've certainly got a very good chance of catching up with them. So what do the habitats look like? Well, this is the sort of area around um, uh, Lake Luban, or uh, Kness Na National Park, I'm sorry, not Lake Luban, we'll get to that in a minute. And just to show you a little bit of some of the habitat around there. And it, as David mentioned, it's, it's also possible to see um, winter swans, hooper swans and Buick swans, particularly hooper swans in, in Latvia, in my experience. And this is just a pair that were uh, in one of the f uh, fields uh, some of them do breed in Latvia, but most of them do migrate further north for the breeding season. So there's usually one or two stragglers hanging around in May uh, to, to at the beginning of the, uh, of the summer. And we'll walk through some of the uh, pine forests here and uh, go along into some of the wetlands along these uh, boardwalks, which are really uh, very well uh, supplied throughout the area. So you're very unlikely to uh, come a cropper walking across boggy ground. There are, there are plenty of boardwalks everywhere, which, is, which makes life quite easy for, for, the, for walking. Now, as David mentioned, um, woodpeckers are a big target for many people, but also this applies to Latvia. And Latvia, we will spend a lot of time looking for uh, woodpeckers. Uh, our guides will often use uh, tapes to hear it, to call them towards us. Uh, obviously, in, in, in uh, moderation, you know, there's, there's, there is a way to do that safely. Uh, but the sort of birds we will be looking for include things like uh, the three-toed woodpecker shown here on the left, uh, the white-backed woodpecker, which is very, very similar to a great spotted woodpecker, but you hopefully will make out the big patch of white on the back that these birds have and not great spotteds. Um, middle spotted woodpecker, it's one of my favorite of the, uh, the European woodpeckers, this bird. And uh, also probably the most dramatic of all, as David's pointed out, the black woodpecker. And this is a really big bird. It's as big as a jackdaw, uh, really powerful beak, very often very noisy, like all the other woodpeckers in the, in the springtime. And that's how, how we can often pick them out by their distinctive calls. And of course, another species of woodpecker not to forget is Rhinec. And there are plenty of Rhinecs to be found uh, on the trip uh, while we're in Latvia. But other small birds, greenish warbler, as David's pointed out, red-breasted flycatcher, hawfinch, and the long-tailed tit. This is the northern version of the long-tailed tit, much, much more attractive, in my humble opinion, than the one we have to put up with in Britain. And uh, they really are like little snowballs with long tails, the, the northern long-tailed tit. It's almost worthwhile going on a trip to the Baltics just to see one of these. They are so stunning uh, as little, little balls of fluff. And owls, again, they're a bit like woodpeckers. We, we try and see as many owls as we possibly can. Uh, this is pygmy owl. Again, it's a bird. It's one of the owls that comes out reasonably early in the evening. So you don't have to wait up until two or three o'clock in the morning to see one. Uh, whereas something like a Ural owl, it is a little bit later. Or even something like a Tengmarm's owl doesn't usually start calling until the wee small hours. So, you know, there are, there are plenty of opportunities for the owl uh, enthusiasts to be satisfied. But the woodland, as, as David's pointed out, is absolutely spectacular through, through most of the, uh, the, the uh, Baltics, and uh, I'm talking obviously about Latvia. And uh, black grouse is again another bird that you perhaps wouldn't be expecting to see, but uh, they are also reasonably common uh, in amongst the pine forests, uh, particularly where these bogs occur. Uh, they are very common there, and also the capercaillie, much harder to find, 
Uh, and, you know, you do can get some interesting encounters, as David's already uh, mentioned on his talk. So this is a view over the reserve at Kerkenes, and um, that's the sort of area of wetland that you can be exploring along these tracks and roads. There is a wonderful variety of waders and, and marsh birds, as well as birds of prey. Birds like white-tailed eagles, again, flying over periodically, putting all the birds up. Uh, so there's plenty to see. And lots of reed beds everywhere for, for the reed beds to be uh, nesting in. So now we move uh, further east to our second uh, accommodation and our second part of the holiday. And uh, this is in the area of Lake Lubans. This is our accommodation. And uh, just to point out, the internet out there works extremely well. They're very sort of uh, high tech. I'll give you an example. The last time I was in that building, I'm a Liverpool supporter and uh, Liverpool playing Tottenham Hotspur in the Champions League final. Everybody had gone to bed and I, I had perfect internet to watch the cup final uh, from that hotel. So just to give you an idea of the, the uh, infrastructure. So what can we see at Lake Lubans that we haven't already encountered? Well, there's often a good passage of marsh turns. So in, on, in this picture, we've got uh, several white wing black turns and a couple of black turns. And uh, these will be passing through at our time of the visit. And they can be found in the area around where we'll be staying at Lake Lubans. And other smaller birds in the marshy areas, things like the little craker, a very unassuming but very attractive bird. This is a male wandering sort of very, very quietly through the reeds. They don't, they're not very obvious at all. So you really do need to keep your eyes peeled to get a glimpse of one of these. And there's a good population of, of wading birds, either um, breeding birds or passing birds, pa birds passing through the country. Uh, so we've got here is a wood sandpiper standing appropriately enough on a piece of wood. And then we've got ruffs, there's a, a, a population of ruffs, which are often uh, to be found at the right time, lecking. This is what they do in the breeding season. The males uh, trying to outdo each other. It's a bit like uh, the old fashioned discotheques, I always imagine. The two different males here, a male with white ruff and a male with a more traditional brown ruff. And they're just trying to out compete each other uh, for the attention of a female. And then birds like marsh sandpiper, we can usually come across several of these birds in some of the wetter areas. And they're a beautiful bird at this time of the year in their spring plumage, uh, with that needle shaped beak, very, very much more of a diminutive green shank really. And again, birds like redneck grebe breeding uh, in breeding plumage. This one is on one of the lakes, uh, Lake Lubans. There's, there's several areas of uh, wetland here and a uh, reasonably common bird to see. Nice to see them in breeding plumage. The ones we tend to see in the UK uh, are mainly in winter plumage. They don't breed, uh, they're not a breeding bird in Britain. And then more, more colorful birds still with, with blue throat singing uh, from the uh, vegetation around the area. Very distinctive calls these birds have and they're very beautiful to look at when you get them in light like this. And more familiar birds, perhaps red starts. There are plenty of red starts uh, to be found in Latvia on our trip over that, over that course of that week. And even familiar birds like red wing, which don't breed in Latvia, they fly further north for the spring, but there's usually a population knocking around uh, by the end of May, middle of May, that we can still find and add to our trip list. And even more bizarrely, birds like barred warbler can be found uh, in the spring in uh, Latvia. They're not a common bird anywhere, but they do look very, very dramatic when you get a view like that. But of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the birds of prey are really dominated by the eagles. And this is particularly the, 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 the particularly commonest one, the white-tailed eagle with the white tail that these adult birds have, the, the juvenile birds, get a progressively whiter tail as they, as they mature. It's only the adults have a pure white tail. And these are still, thankfully, reasonably commonly encountered uh, it, throughout the country of Latvia. So just like David, I, I would certainly advocate a trip to Latvia. Uh, and you know the, the people are incredibly friendly. The infrastructure is excellent. The, the countryside is superb. And most importantly of all, the wildlife is fantastic. So I will stop there um, and I will leave, hand over rather to Sarah. 
Thank you so much, Kevin. That was a fantastic talk. And I'll just see if I can, there you go, you stop sharing your screen. Brilliant. Right, folks, we're going to go to a short break now. We have <laughs> 10 minutes. So if you would like to uh, nip to the loo, top up your wine or beer uh, and top up your glass of um, your bowl of nibbles, that's absolutely fine. We're back at uh, 25 past eight. Now, by request, instead of playing our usual interview, interval music, I'll instead display my fish tank for you. This is a request I had a couple of weeks ago after doing it for our cruise this evening. Um, so I've got a couple of kitchen chairs to stack and balance my laptop on. Hopefully it'll work. Um, so bear with me and uh, I'll be back with you in one minute where you can sit and enjoy my fish. They've been looking forward to this all day. So I hope it works. See you shortly.
Hello folks, welcome back. And I uh, hope you've had time to go and get yourselves a drink. And we're now going to hand over to Alison, who's taking us to Lithuania. Over to you, Alison. Thank you, Sarah. Um, good evening, everyone. It's nice to uh, be joining you this evening. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you so you can see um, um, what's going on. Okay, so this evening I'm uh, going to be um, sharing a little bit with you about our tours to um, Lithuania. Um, Lithuania is a new destination for us and we're very excited to be working with uh, Marius and Regila out of uh, Lithuania uh, to bring these to you. Um, Lithuania is the largest and more southerly um, of the three Baltic states. Uh, right down in the southeast is the capital uh, Vilnius. Um, and we're going to be offering two tours to Lithuania for, for the moment, um, offering a spring tour and an autumn tour. Uh, the spring tour takes in the Baltic coast, particularly around the Benti Cape um, and Coronian Spit, as well as the um, taiga forests in the east of the country. The autumn tour also takes in the Baltic coast around the Venti Cape and Coronian Spit, as well as uh, a variety of the, the local village fish ponds and the woodlands to the south of the country as well. Spring in Lithuania uh, brings in um, a number of the summer breeders um, back into the country, um, but there's also a huge number of migrating birds that are traveling through, um, heading for the north as well, that stop over on their way. Um, Lithuania is, uh, lies on the Baltic Flyway, as um, Kevin mentioned earlier, and the other Baltic states do as well, which means a large number of species do tend to stop off in all three of the states um, during the seasons of migration, both in spring and autumn. The um, spring tour starts um, um, right in the um, west of the country, over towards the Venti Cape. Um, around here, um, around the uh, village fish ponds and along the coastal areas, we'll be looking out for species such as uh, Slavonian and red net grebe, as well as potchard and tufted ducks. Around the reed bed areas, we'll be looking for uh, bittern, um, and perhaps overhead, we might find hawking hobby. Poo-poo are also possible, as are grey partridge and grasshopper warbler. In the mornings, um, we head along to the Venti Cape Lighthouse, and there's a very large ringing station here uh, that monitors the migration. In the fields nearby and around the scrub areas, um, we'll be looking out for a, a number of different species, um, including the barred warbler and hawfinch. And then along the coastal um, sections that are around the front of the lighthouse, we'll be looking for Caspian gull, which tend to like to hang out along the pier there. During the rest of the day, we'll be heading out into the uh, numinous uh, De Delta Regional Park, um, where particular specialities are, including some of the birds we might have already seen this evening, um, but also um, a number of others as well. Oh dear folks, I think we've lost Alison. I can't see her anymore or, and Kevin is just coming back. That's strange that, uh, that's strange that Alison has gone. Just stand by for a second folks, we'll just see. Ah, I've had a message from her saying the computer connection has cut out, she's trying to get back online. Right, okay. Well, as she's just trying to get back online, we also have Marius here joining us live from Lithuania. Marius, hi. hi. Marius. Hello. Hi. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Just while Alison's coming back 
online. Do you want to uh, introduce yourself and, and say a few things? Yeah, actually, I'm a birding Lithuania company leader and I'm a guide as well. So we are organizing birding tours in uh, Lithuania for eight years already for different European countries. I'm very pleased to be invited in the Nature Track team as one of the destinations for Nature Track just uh, two years ago. Of course, because of the COVID situation, uh, Corona, it was not very good. Uh, start for us, but I'm very happy last autumn we had uh, the first tour with you and uh, now uh, we are planning for the uh, this year, the spring tour in Lithuania, which is really very interesting personally for me because it is the longest tour for us and uh, it is a nine days long starting in the western part of Lithuania, Alice and Solar have already told a little bit about this and uh, started in Amnes Delta later, Koronians, but later eastern part of the country. So yeah, this tour is one of the most special because of those uh, eastern specialities you can find in Lithuania, like uh, citron backtail, great snipe, uh, greenish warbler, tree toe woodpecker, owls, and many more other species. So yeah, it's uh, one of uh, one of our main tours the uh, foreigners are interested to come for and of course auto migration is really amazing but i'm giving the word to alison i see she's joining already <laughs> thank you so much marius for tidying us over for a couple of minutes there we can't wait to come back to you and we'll look forward to hearing uh, yeah. more from you in a moment so thank you very much alison yeah. if you'd like to pick up where you left off I'm really sorry about that. Uh, some technical issue decided my computer was going to restart. So um, I do apologize about that. Um, let me see if I can pick up where we uh, left off. We had a, a photograph of a wryneck and uh, some other some other birds. That was your last slide, I think. Oh, the whole uh, hawfinch actually. Bard warbler. Sorry, I'm thinking of something else. Yeah, hawfinch. Yeah. Okay. Great, apologies about that. All right, so um, yeah, heading out into the uh, the Numinous Delta region, um, we'll uh, pick up species such as the, the citrine wagtail, um, also species such as uh, the black tern um, or, and little gulls as well. Uh, Montague's harrier um, can also be found, um, as well as a number of other species, including blue throat, spotted crake, and uh, rough, perhaps the males in breeding plumage. If we're very fortunate, we may find a couple of the, the local specialities, uh, which include the great snipe and the aquatic warbler. Uh, one day we'll be heading out to the um, Augstumala raised bog, uh, where there's um, a, a boardwalk through the marshland areas, a bit like you get in both um, Estonia and Latvia as well. Here we'll be looking for species such as the golden plover, um, or perhaps a uh, great grey shrike as well. In the surrounding birch woodlands, um, there are a number of uh, smaller bird species we'll be looking to pick up here, um, including uh, the wood warbler, golden oriole, tree pipit and the lovely black woodpeckers as well. The nearby forest meadows um, are our favourite favorite hunting site um, of both the um, greater and lesser spotted eagle, as well as a number of other raptors, including marsh and Montague's harriers, red and black kites and white-tailed eagle too. Around the forest edges, it's a very good place to look out for uh, river warbler um, if they've arrived in in time. So let me just see if I can... Oh. Excuse me, that photo didn't seem to want to load up, so uh, we'll, we'll skip past that one. Um, around the Kintai fish pond areas, uh, we're looking for waders and wildfowl. Uh, sometimes there'll be hundreds of migrants uh, still in the area as well. And these might include curly sandpiper, little stint, spotted red shank, avocet, black-tailed godwit, and it's also a very reliable site uh, for um, white-tailed eagle, um, often hunting um, the various other species that are around. After a few days here, we'll take a boat trip out into the Numinous Delta, um, where we'll be looking for species such as the Penduline tit, but also terns and gulls, pintail and golden eye and other water birds too. After a trip around the area, we'll head, keep heading um, out in the boat and um, across the Coronian Lagoon, out onto the Coronian Spit. 
Um, this is uh, quite a lot of dune habitat, but also very good for sea watching and uh, visits to one of the ringing stations out there as well. Uh, this one is a little bit tricky to pronounce. It's called uh, Jodkranta, um, and uh, in the woodlands around about it, um, a number of species such as wood warbler, red breasted flycatcher, possibility of the rare greenish warbler, tree pipit, um, are things that we might find in that area. It's also a good place to look out for elk as well. For the last part of the tour, we head right across to the east of the country, stopping en route um, to the Vrajnii uh, fish ponds, uh, where we'll be searching out for species such as whooper swan, black stork, and possibility of breeding Slavonian grebe as well. Once we get to the east, we'll be uh, going to um, Aukstatiya National Park, uh, where the accommodation is set right in the middle of the taiga forest. Just a few minutes walk away, we'll be able to find um, evening species such as the nightjar, pygmy owl and woodcock. During our morning walks, we'll be looking for uh, woodpeckers particularly, um, including black, grey-headed, white-backed, three-toed woodpecker, and there is a possibility of hazel grouse or hazel hen as well. Grajuti National Park is a regional park, sorry, is a mixture of uh, forests and lakes. And here particularly um, important species is the breeding black-throated diver. Also possibilities of uh, Slavonian grebe um, and golden eye as well. There's about 190 species of bird that have been recorded just in this very small part of the country in this regional park, along with many plants and around about 400 species of lichens and fungi. So there is a bit of variety there for people who want a bit more of a broad range than just birds. It's a very good place for birds of prey, including lesser spotted eagle um, and the lovely honey birds too. The mosaic of woodlands, meadows, ponds and bogs um, means that there's a good chance of finding a, a variety of species, um, including the spotted nutcracker, um, black grouse as well, corn crake, red breasted flycatcher and the marsh sandpiper, which is on the edge of its range um, in the east of uh, Lithuania, as well as the possibility of finding some breeding European rollers, which only breed in one or two sites in the country as well. The tour finishes in uh, Vilnius, which is the capital city, um, and if there's time, there'll be uh, a tour of the old town to see some of the architecture and historical sites there before a flight departs. The autumn tour starts around the same kind of place as the spring tour, um, but there's some very different range of species that are likely to find around the Benti Cape area. These include both the common and black red starts, um, rock pipit, chiff chaff, willow warbler, black cap and garden warbler. Heading along the Caronian Lagoon towards the lighthouse, we're looking out for migrating gulls, waders and raptors. And there can be thousands of birds in an hour um, during the peak of migration time, seeming like a river of birds overhead. Ringing Station and um, now some of the species that they're going to be um, catching at this time of year are going to include um, some of the ones we're quite familiar with such as Red Wing, um, perhaps European Serin as well, Willow Tit, Brambling and Siskin. And um, if it's a good morning for, for catching you might have an opportunity as well to see some birds quite close up and it's always really interesting to see the different types of plumage um, and the different coloration you can see when they're in the hand. In the surrounding fields, uh, there'll be uh, large flocks of wildfowl gathering, uh, geese and swans particularly, um, and this attracts in a good variety of raptors, including a uh, rough-legged buzzard, marsh harrier, perlin, sorry, excuse me, peregrine, merlin and northern goshawk. Um, around the Kintai fish pond area, we're looking for wildfowl and perhaps a few late waders, and these can include uh, greater scop, um, golden eye and tufted ducks, common potchard um, and gadwall. Again, we'll be heading out into the uh, Numinous Delta um, and over to the Coronian Spit um, on a boat. And then birds that we'll be looking to pick up um, here will include herons and egrets, ducks, kingfishers and white-tailed eagles again. 
Out on the spit, we have visited a variety of the different dune habitats, um, but including a visit to the Pernidus dune, as well as the grey dunes. These both have a slight elevation, which helps us to get a good sense um, of the area and to also have a good watch point to look out for migration from. We might see very large flocks of thrushes or perhaps wood pigeon heading overhead on their journey south. Possibility of a good number of raptors here too, um, including um, pallid harrier, merlin, kestrel, peregrine and goshawk. Around the fishing villages, uh, the gardens can be a good place to look for some rarer species. Um, and these might include things such as the yellow bride, palaces or dusky warbler. Red flank blue tail um, and Siberian chef chaff are also possibilities that can turn up as well. Common species that we'll see around the village areas will also include things like skylark, meadow pipit and woodlark. And again, it's a good place um, all in the long spit to look out for Eurasian elk. Out in the lagoons, um, on the, um, just off the shoreline, a um, good possibility of lots of sea ducks. Um, again, including um, species such as the long-tailed duck that um, both Kevin and David mentioned you can find in the other two Baltic states as well. Also possibility of common and velvet scoters, as well as both red and black throated diver. Some raptors will use the water currents to aid their journey south. It's always a good idea when we're scanning the waves to keep an eye out for those as well. Along the beaches, there's a possibility of uh, waders, including red knot, sandaling, grey plover and black tailed godwits. Again, at the Yokrancha uh, ringing station, um, they can have a good number of interesting birds at this time of year. And one thing we particularly find is often long-eared owls. And on a good night, they can have over 50, 50 different individual birds that are ringed on their migration. In the woodlands right about, a um, good place to look out for woodpeckers, including black, middle and lesser spotted woodpecker, as along with crossbill, willow tit, nuthatch, and long-tailed tits. Um, again, these are the sort of white-headed variety that um, Kevin was talking about in Latvia. The final couple of days um, of this autumn tour are spent in the south of the country, where there's a very large uh, common crane staging post. And it's a fantastic experience to watch as they all gather to roost at sunset. Um, often very noisy, but very impressive and very elegant birds as well. And then the final uh, part of the trip is down to uh, uh, Punia Woods, which is an ancient woodland uh, set along the Numinous River. There are oak trees here that are over 600 years old, um, and it's a, it's a great habitat for woodpeckers. Uh, lots of different species here, including the um, grey-headed, black, green, great, middle and lesser spotted and white-backed woodpecker as well. It's also a possibility of hearing, if not seeing, uh, spotted nutcracker, hazel grice and pygmy owl. Um, and uh, particularly during the autumn time, it's a wonderful chance to see some of the autumn colours on the different trees as well. Again, the tour finishes back in Vilnius um, with um, a tie in to have a tour of the old time um, if flight time permit. So that's just a very quick overview of the itineraries of our tour, um, but to help give us a bit of a flavour and sense of the country, um, I thought it'd be great if uh, Marius and uh, Regula could share a little bit about some of their own experiences in the country with us, uh, just to give us a better sense um, of, um, of the area. So um, firstly, um, I don't mind which of the answers, could you um, say a little bit about why you think um, Lithuania is special and why you think uh, it's a good place to visit? Good evening everybody, uh, I probably can start with this uh, question uh, because uh, uh, when uh, Alison uh, contacted uh, us and asked this, uh, I also was thinking what's so special about Lithuania, but actually uh, when Alison introduced both of our tours, uh, spring and autumn, it's uh, the main uh, idea that uh, such a small country has such a big variety of different uh, habitats, different bird species and different experiences that we can offer you. And uh, both of our tours, uh, as Marius uh, before uh, mentioned, uh, are spectacular and especially spring, uh, which is the longest tour that we have. 
and uh, it uh, combines uh, the experience of sandy dunes of Coronian spit, uh, which uh, is uh, quite an experience. And then moving to the inland, uh, which uh, with the forest and that uh, unique and authentic uh, uh, accommodation there in in the middle of the forest. And I think these um, feelings uh, you get from uh, watching birds uh, on the Coronian spit and uh, seeing that uh, flyway of of Baltic, uh, it's it's really nice and uh, and uh, great uh, great impression. So I think that's that's the main uh, thing that we can offer: the variety of habitats, a variety of different species, and uh, different locations, and uh, at the same time, the authentic feeling of Lithuania. That's great, thank you. Um, can you just explain a little bit about what the accommodation that we use on the tours is like as well? Uh, yes, on the western coast, uh, since it's the touristic area, it's the, the Baltic uh, coast, uh, so of course uh, we can't choose uh, uh, really small, uh, small places and uh, it usually is uh, uh, hotels or uh, guest houses uh, uh, which with the standard accommodation and on the eastern coast uh, and the southern coast uh, we have uh, more uh, rural uh, accommodation when you get uh, the experience uh, living uh, in the in the middle of the nature and uh, these type also are uh, uh, really uh, showing the Lithuanian uh, uh, historically and uh, uh, cultural experience so so that's pretty much two type of accommodation we get of course uh, both of them they have the level of uh, standard European uh, accommodation, uh, which uh, includes uh, good quality of food and uh, good quality of uh, different uh, rooms for uh, for the guests. Uh, but uh, in general, you get the feeling both from uh, the standard European and then uh, to the rural and authentic Lithuanian. Great, thank you. Uh, talking about food, can you maybe say a little bit about, about what type of food is traditionally Lithuanian um, and also what type of food is typically served at the hotels and accommodation? Uh, yeah, we uh, during our uh, tour, uh, we focus, of course, on uh, European cuisine and uh, we don't uh, try to, uh, I don't know, surprise you too much. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, we try to introduce uh, uh, to traditional Lithuanian cuisine. And uh, it's uh, pretty simple, actually. We love potatoes and we love meat, and uh, that's, uh, that's what we uh, eat the most. Uh, but of course, there are some of, uh, uh, well, just uh, a wish of tasting uh, some of the Lithuanian dishes, so which is not that uh, culturally uh, common uh, across the Europe, but uh, we try, for example, uh, cold uh, beetroot uh, soup sheltibarshi, uh, which uh, it might be might become uh, in favor for some uh, tourists. But uh, the others, uh, the pink uh, soup doesn't look that uh, delicious. But uh, at the same time, we also offer the uh, possibility to choose and uh, to have a tasting experience if uh, somebody is interested in that. Uh, and on the other hand, there is also always possibility to have just traditional European cuisine. Great, thank you. Um, do either of you have a favorite place in Lithuania to visit um, and why? Mm, I think, well, I, I can just uh, say mine and then Marius could follow. Uh, I think uh, my speciality is Namnas Delta uh, since it's uh, uh, the great uh, numbers of birds and uh, impressive uh, impressive sights in the spring and autumn as well. Okay, thank you very much. Next to Maris. Yeah, I, I just fully agree with Rogelia. The Namnas Delta is really impressive and uh, I think that's what, uh, what makes Lithuania special and different from uh, other Baltic uh, countries. And uh, yeah, it's really a huge area of flooded meadows. And uh, when the flood gone, so all those species, meadow species, which come back from south and uh, 
southern parts of Europe and, and uh, Africa, India, they start to breathe there. So yeah, Namla's Delta is very special in spring, but uh, for autumn migration, Coronian Spit, it's a very special place. It's 100 kilometer long, uh, narrow piece of land between the Coronian Lagoon and the Baltic Sea, which separates the continental Lithuania to, to, to the Spit. And it's actually in autumn, it's like a, a highway for birds because all those birds were coming from uh, from north, from Estonia, Latvia, they are really concentrating on this narrow piece of land and the concentrations of birds, especially in the end of September and, and beginning of October, sometimes reaches amazing gamels of birds just flying overhead, like uh, it's like a river, birds in the sky, and uh, it's you can ha hardly can't count those, those birds just flying overhead. It's The feeling is really phenomenal phenomenos and uh, yeah that's that's the feeling I really like especially in autumn in the end of September and beginning of October and uh, of course to 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 try to separate those species because there are also many northern specialities coming from Scandinavian countries from western Russia Siberia and uh, uh, Together with them, also there are some uh, all those uh, rare specialities like yellow brow warbler or dusk warbler. Of course, it's very very hard to distinguish those birds, but we are always uh, focusing on them and trying to find those those rarities. Yeah, so I think those two regions, uh, are Namunas Delta and Kronian Spit, I think that's. Uh, quite different and that's the I think the goal to visit in our country and that's why I really like them. Right, thank you very much. Um, I think that's um, that given us a really good flavour of the country and, and given us a really good, a good idea about what kind of um, experience you can have while you're there. So thank you very much uh, for sharing with us um, and thank you everyone at home for listening. Um, I'm going to hand back to Sarah now. Thanks very much, Alison, and thank you so much, uh, Maris and Regili, for those uh, questions and that great insight to your um, to the, the culture and the wildlife of your country as well. We'll now go to any questions. If any of you have any final questions to to ask, uh, you're very welcome to put them to us. Please do just pop them into the Q and A section now. We have had a few questions put to us throughout the evening, so. I can just uh, put those to the, the panelists. They have been answered already, but sometimes answering them verbally just allows you to answer the question a bit more fully. So um, David, a question for you. Are there dragonflies uh, in Estonia um, at the time of year that you lead our trips? You're on mute. Classic. There we uh, go. Ge ge yeah, ge generally in sort of mid 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 May when we're there, it, it, it's yeah. If, in an early spring, there's some emergence, and we often see species like downy emeralds frequently, white-faced darts, a few of the sort of damsels and stuff. But I think if you were if you're going specifically with the intention of dragonflies, yeah, you, you'd probably want to leave it a a month or two later, I suspect. Uh, to get the best and it's the same for butterflies as well there's some really good early butterflies things like map and um yeah some of the kind of cranberry fritillary and stuff like that but uh, again to start getting the really special uh, kind of northern boreal species you really would be going into kind of june and july but you'd also get the midges then as well so yes <laughs> Ah, the beloved midges. And what about the drives in between the different destinations that you're going to on the, the trip? So they, they tend to be, I mean, if you just got on with it, they tend to be about two to three hours of straight driving. But what we do is we take all day to do the transfers by and large uh, between the different locations. So we'll, we'll literally take a day and we'll have multiple stops on the way, birding, uh, good hearty warming lunch and kind of loose stops. So yeah, they, they don't feel draining at all. So they just become like one of the days out really. I think I think that's that's certainly the same for Latvia. And I think in my experience, it's pretty well the same for all nature trek trips. <laughs> uh, you know, certainly as leaders, we don't want to be driving for eight hours at a stretch. 
Uh, but no, it, it's much more sensible to stop and, and choose a place that looks looks good en route from from uh, place A to place B. As David says, get out, stretch your legs, loose stop, nice lunch, relax, and then carry on a, a, a little bit further. And, and the distances in Latvia are, are, are not huge either. Thanks, Kevin. And I'll put this question to uh, all of the panelists. This is from Jennifer Earle asking, do you recommend to take a scope or will binoculars suffice? After you, just, David. I, well, I was just typing an answer, Jennifer, but um, you'll definitely want binoculars with you. And a scope really adds something to uh, particularly kind of getting in onto the kind of perhaps waders on migration, things like that. But if you've not got one or you don't want to carry one, uh, certainly on the Estonia trip, me and Matty have a scope with us um, and often others in the group do as well. So you'd certainly be able to borrow one. And, and I would echo everything that David's just said. Uh, you know, I always take a scope with me. Our, our local guides usually got a scope. They are useful to have. It's something else to carry around, um, particularly if you're a photographer as well. That's three bits of equipment. But, you know, it, it usually works out very well. You know, if, if you've not got a scope, then, you know, you can use one either mine or somebody else's. Thank you both. And David, another question for you. What are the chances of seeing wolves or bears in Estonia? Um, I, I think being honest, physically seeing them is, is a case of luck. I mean, the, the tour isn't really geared around seeing those large mammals. Although I have been talking to David over the last couple of years and unfortunately, COVID got in the way of that about Matty and I have got some ideas for potentially developing a kind of birds and mammals tour because there are some really good bear hides in Estonia mm -hmm. um, and certainly Matty's home farm has bears come rummaging the apples in the orchard in the autumn um, so yeah I mean both me and Matty take trail cameras with us and often put them out and we've not got lucky yet but we do see a lot of really fresh tracks and scats and things like that so I think it's just right place right time. Mm. Well, something that could potentially be developed then. So watch this space if you're interested in something like that, I would say. Or do we have any more questions that we have not answered? Um, uh, someone's saying they'd love a mammals tour. Okay, good to know the interest is there. There you go, David, you need to get on it now. Autumn's probably the best time. So when particularly- yeah, when they're of, feeding up before- Yeah, winter. feeding up, fattening up for the winter and there's often youngsters about as well. I shouldn't throw it in, but having just got back from Estonia, there were we had quite a lot of sightings of moose, uh, lots of red foxes, a few red squirrels, but the, the pick of the lot was a, a, a lynx. We had a, a lynx, which nice. was really uh, astonishing sight in the snow, which was even better. Yeah. Wow. Lovely. That must have just been magical. It was wonderful. We have raccoon dog most trips, depending on where your views are on there. Yeah. <laughs> semi-naturalized species i know a lot of british people that don't see raccoon dog get quite excited at that um grim williams is asking are there, is there a chance of flying squirrel uh so that's one of the species that's on my list for if we were to develop the estonia mammal tour because um yeah again we've got some contacts that um go around doing box monitoring and if that's the Gwyn Williams I know, uh, be delighted to take Gwyn to show him some flying squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've got, we have got demand for you to set up a, a tour, David. Uh, Paul and Julia saying yes. When can David? And, and also Eurasian tour? mink as well as the other kind of choice mammal um, that's um, possible as well. Not not this kind of horrible American invasive one. No. Well, that sounds very good. Do do get on that, David, and keep us posted. Right, folks, well, if that's all the questions that we have for this evening, we are finishing early, of course, because we have um, uh, reduced by, by one talk. Uh, sorry, I've just had another question coming from Alan Woodward asking, do the timing of the trips allow for combining two countries in one trip? Alison, that might have to go to you as operations. Um, at the moment, we haven't generally uh, coordinated them to go one into the other, uh, mainly because the best time to head to each country is pretty much the same week. Um, but it is certainly something that we uh, we do consider, um, and if it is something we can we can possibly do, we we can look at we can look at doing that. We could do a, a sort of tailor made option as well, or an extension to a, a country another country, couldn't we? After a group tour. 
yeah yeah definitely we could definitely extend to a different baltic state um if you wanted to do one tour and then do a few days in another one with a with a local guide yeah right folks well i think uh oh jill you said you put a question earlier has it been answered uh yes that has been answered um it was from david this is about the population of capacali in estonia uh david you did comment on that yeah so in terms of in terms of cappers i think that the data i've got is about 12 to thirteen thousand lecky males um i'm not sure about the black grouse numbers that's significantly more uh, but like the uk cappers are not doing particularly well at the moment they're on the decline and raccoon dog potential is one of the uh, the issues with them as well right okay great well thank you all so much and thank you all for your very lovely comments that you're all putting in the chat i'm so pleased that you've enjoyed the evening a big thank you to david kevin allison for your talks tonight and a very special thank you to maris and raguli for joining us this evening. The enthusiasm that both of you have shown for the wildlife of Lithuania was really just infectious and it's been lovely to listen to you. Uh, I'm sure you've inspired many people to come and visit. It's been a real pleasure to listen to your expertise and thank you so much all of you for taking the time to transport us across the world to the Baltics this evening. Now, uh, we hope you can join us next week where we'll be taking you in search of butterflies and moths covering the UK, the Dolomites, Macedonia, the Pyrenees and Armenia. That's on Monday the 9th next week at our usual time of 7.30 p.m. You can sign up on our website and you'll also receive a link to do so in the follow-up email from this presentation. So we hope to see you on Monday and until then, take care folks and we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining. Bye.